So when Jesus says the gates of hell should not prevail, he's not saying that the church can survive the attack of hell. He's saying hell cannot survive the attack of the church. You're going to get it in a minute. Um, Y'all, we had this thing backwards. We're not on defense. We're supposed to be on offense. We're not supposed to endure hell. We're supposed to attack hell and tear hell down because hell cannot stand against the church. We are engaged in a conflict and we are stronger. It's about to get real quiet in here because this is Alpha Tree. I know it's about to get real quiet, real quiet. Because what Jesus is indicating is that spiritual warfare is a reality. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on and give God worry. Give God his rightful praise. If you are thankful, open up your mouth and say something. If you are grateful, open up your lips and make the praises roll off your tongue. Somebody give him glory. Come on, we've come into the house to exalt his name. We've come into the house to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody give him glory. I want all the people who believe God is faithful to just lift up their hands and wave to Zion and say, I know God is faithful. We're going to sing this familiar song together. Hey, yeah. Call you holy, your name is holy, you are so holy to me. I call you holy, your name is holy, holy you are, and holy you'll be. Anybody believe God is holy? Let me hear you sing. Say, I call you. Jesus, I call you holy, say, I call you holy. 
Hey, 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 h
This is the day that the Lord has made. We've come to rejoice and be made glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And it reads, O oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, with all your soul, with all your mind. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them with, talk about them when you are at home and when you are away when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God's word for the people of God. We have some names on our prayer list here in the sanctuary, and I'm sure there are some names in the virtual congregation as well. Let us pray for Erica and Idris Albert on the transitioning of their father and father-in-law, Arthur Will Willie Esperson, Jr. Let us pray for Stacy Fuji in the passing of her grandmother, Ruth Simpson Blake. Let us also pray for Pamela Russell Trimble and Thelma Russell. Their daughter and wife has made the tran tr transition. Let us also pray for Reverend Ed Jackson, his niece, Jacqueline and Lily, has made the transition. Sure, there's some names that you have brought into the sanctuary as well in the virtual sanctuary. Other those names at this time, if you would please. Let us pray. God, how we thank you for just being God. God, we thank you that you are the God of comfort, the God of grace, and the God of mercy. God, we have some names that are listed where they are walking, the families are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. The wonderful thing about them that they are walking, but you are on the other side of their walk. God, we ask right now that you would intervene in their lives. Not only intervene in their lives, intervene in their situation, oh God. But God, not only intervene in their lives, but in our lives here at Alfred Street. God, we need you. We've came into this sanctuary with petitions and we are laying them at your feet, oh God. We know that we are not capable of handling them, but if we give them to you, you will make everything all right. So spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us right now. Have your way in this service. Throw your weight around in this service so that when we leave, we know that we are better because we've been in your presence. We don't have to wait until the battle is over. We have enough confidence in you that we can shout right now. So God, have your way. Do what only you can do and we'll be careful to give your name the glory, the honor in which it is due. We pray this prayer with thanksgiving and expectation right now. And let us all say amen. amen. Let us stand and sing our hymn of rejoicing. They'll know we are Christians by our love.
Christian love one with another as we pass the peace. Alfred Street. To our family and friends who not only join us in this sacred space of sanctuary for worship, but to those who connect around the world wide web. Grace and peace be unto each and every one of you from God, 
who loves us as a mother and a father, and Jesus Christ, who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning Redeemer. I pray I'm not the only one that comes into this space knowing that this is another day that the Lord has made, and we woke up to rejoice and to be glad in it. We welcome each and every one of you on this Lord's Day as we come to make glorious the name of Jesus, who is our Christ. As we give thanks to God in this season of thanksgiving, which is not just a day for the life of a believer, but rather a way of living, that we give thanks to God every day. Every now and then you need to be reminded of what you're thankful for. I know that some of us come in this place with some problems that have yet to be solved, some prayers that have seemingly not been answered, some people that God hadn't dealt with yet. Amen. But in spite of all that, we have a reason to be grateful. Because we have a Savior who died on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And whenever you think your list is short for Thanksgiving, I dare you to go back to Calvary. To think about how much God loves you, how God proved it. And we ought always rejoice and be grateful. Here at Alpha Treat, we celebrate an open communion, which means if you believe that Christ died and rose again, we invite you to this sacred moment of reverence and reflection and remembrance. When you walked in today, prayerfully you received the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you did not, if you just wave a hand, there are deacons who will joyfully serve you even now. To our family watching online, won't you take this opportunity to lay hold of the bread and the cup you use to symbolize the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I share with our congregation at eight o'clock one of my favorite hymns as a child that I find myself reciting as my week goes on and I run into things unplanned and unprepared for. Accident almost happened, someone cut me off in traffic and I feel like revealing my, my ability to get back. I whisper these words, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain. Free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. We remind ourselves of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection three days later. We do it by eating bread together. The bread which symbolizes the broken body of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who alone is our Christ. He died. He was buried. He resurrected from the dead. He's ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, making intercessions for our sins. And one day, to the glory of God, we just believe he's coming back. Let us break bread and eat together. We also drink of the cup with the memorial of the blood shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins. Remission simply means that something's gone, but it has the tendency to come back. All of us are sinners saved by God's grace, and if the truth be told, every day a little sin creeps back in. We all stand in need of the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive us and give us another chance. This is the blood of our Lord and Savior. Let us drink together. Pray with me, family. In our faith, Lord, we receive what you offer in your grace. The complete and absolute forgiveness of our sins, the eternal security of our soul's salvation, the precious promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is acceptable unto you, and the commandment we have to infect others with the transformative love of Jesus Christ as we seek to make more disciples. God, we receive your forgiveness. May you teach us now how to offer it to one another. And as you've shown your love to us, may we show our love to one another. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. amen. Family, whenever we gather in worship on Sunday mornings, we acknowledge the presence of God. Today we begin by acknowledging God's presence in the gift of new life that God has seen fit to add to the families of Alpha Street Baptist Church. 
Isn't it amazing that when God decided to come to the earth, God did not come as a king on a stallion or a warrior with a battalion of angels, but God chose to make God's self known as a child. And there were so many who missed that God had come, and maybe they missed it because they couldn't see God in the life of a child. We pause to recognize the gift of God in the lives of these children who we're about to dedicate. In just a moment, parents are gonna come forth with bundles of joy. We're gonna make sure we pronounce their name correctly because names matter. We'll anoint them with oil and cover them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the child is gonna be turned around and mom or dad is gonna lift that child up in good Simba, Lion King fashion. And I want you to applaud and clap so that this child for the first time, which will hopefully happen many times, they hear the celebration of a community of faith that believes God is at work in their lives. To those parents who bring your children today, we celebrate with you. What a blessing it is to know that God has seen fit to bring healthy life through you into this world. And as a parent, I'm gonna tell you a few things. Number one, you will never have a good night of sleep again in your life. Um, that you will learn to pray in ways that you did not know you could pray. That you'll feel the weight of knowing that you are in competition with your children's friends that you have an obligation to raise them in a family of faith where they know, love, and serve Jesus Christ. We pray that God give you wisdom for the difficult decisions you have to make, that God give you faith to trust and believe that God is watching over your children even when you can't, that God will give you a sacrificial heart to know that all God has blessed you with, you render freely for the well-being of your children. And most importantly, that God will give you a new definition of love. That if by chance your daughter or son finds a prodigal path of life, they will always know that they can come back home. Family and I charge us to be that family of faith that prays over and encourages and celebrates our children. That we see God at work in them. That we embrace them in this church family. That we prioritize children's ministries that we encourage them to grow in their walk with Christ Jesus. We celebrate who they are as they come of age. I want you to pray with me, family. God, you came as a child, and today we just believe that your presence is in the lives of these who come today. For all that you did to protect and bring them safely into this world, we give you thanks. For the homes in which they've been born and birthed into, the families and the aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, the godparents. Lord, we pray that you would surround them with men and women of faith who unashamedly live boldly for Jesus Christ. God, I pray that your hand would be upon them, that no demonic perversion, no molestation, no spirit of addiction would befall them, but that they would grow mighty in stature and in favor with you that in these pews today, oh God, is the next woman and man who will change this world for the better. God, we ask that you to awaken their intelligence. God, that you would allow them climb over every obstacle put in their way. And that one day these children who we pray for and dedicate today will see in the waters of baptism as they make their own confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This we ask, oh God, in the name of the one who was our child and is now our King. In Jesus our Christ, we do pray, amen. amen. What is the chosen name of your son? Ethan. Ethan DeLeon Harrison. Harrison. Will all those who are here celebrating the life of Ethan DeLeon Harrison please stand? I, I'm going to get you. I bless the Ethan DeLeon Harrison in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Master Ethan family, turn with me.
Congratulations. Congratulations. With all those who are here celebrating, Renee Avery Wilson, please stand. I bless thee, Renee Avery Wilson, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Miss Renee, everyone, help me celebrate her. Congratulations. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Y'all gonna keep me in business. <laughs> and what is the chosen name of your daughter? Will all those who are here celebrating the life of Chandler Louise Shelton please stand? I bless thee, Chandler Louise Shelton, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Miss Chandler family. <laughs> and what is the name of your daughter? Zaria Sinclair Armstead. Will all those who are here to celebrate the life of Zaria Sinclair Armstead please stand? <laughs> well, all right, baby. You've got the most beautiful eyes. I bless thee, Zaria Sinclair Armstead, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Miss Zaria family. Congratulations, you all. Alfred, would you help me thank God for the amazing gift of our children who we bless on today? God is in this space. We recognize the presence of God also with our friends and family who are guests. We know that with the holidays upon us and with the children that are being dedicated, there may be some folk worshiping with us who are not members, but we value you. If you are a guest of our church and you don't mind us recognizing you, would you do me a favor? Would you wave a hand in the air as we recognize our guests on this Sunday morning? Alpha Street, help me bless God for them on today. As we pray for them as infants, we've got some who are college students who are home today. I am blessed that my son is home from school as well as some others. I'm gonna ask all of our college students who are home for Thanksgiving, would you just stand that we can thank God that you're with us today. Any college students home? Amen, finish the semester strong, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Any birthdays, God has been good to us in the gift of life. And there may be someone celebrating a birthday. If God has blessed you with 52 more weeks of mercies that you know you're not worthy of, but you're grateful for. Will all of our birthdays please stand as we acknowledge them. Chapman, happy birthday. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to all of you. And then finally, we also acknowledge the gift of love and our couples, our anniversaries that are being celebrated with our married couples. If you all are celebrating, uh, amen. Another, another year of more better than worse, amen. We're gonna ask you to stand. Any anniversaries in Alpha Street today? Any couples celebrating a year? Oh, nobody got married around Thanksgiving, huh? Okay, listen, if, if the person next to you doesn't have a ring on, just look at them and tell them, keep hope alive. Keep hope alive in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey family, very quickly as we get ready to give, um, some amazing things are happening in the life of the church. I'm asking you to be prayerful and to support through your giving. 
Number one, one, let you know that we've come to the conclusion of verses. It will not air this week because of the holidays and Thanksgiving. But on next Tuesday, the championship round of season three of verses will air. I pray that you've enjoyed studying the Bible through trivia and that we'll see who is the new champion on next Tuesday. Not this upcoming Tuesday, but next Tuesday. We're getting ready to enter the busy season of the end of the year and the holidays. I pray first and foremost that you all have a beautiful and blessed Thanksgiving, especially for those who this Thanksgiving may be the first one without a loved one. We remember you in our prayers and I pray that you will still find a reason to be grateful on this upcoming Thursday. Don't forget that on December 5th, we will be at the Kennedy Center to celebrate the birth of Christ in song with our musical guest, Yolanda Adams. The preceding Saturday, the 2nd of December, we have a special service of ordination here at the church family. We have four sisters who have passed their catechism and are preparing to have their hands laid on as we ordain them into ministry. I know that one is here, Lisa's here, if you would stand. Lisa's getting ready to get ordained. <laughs> Kim, Heather, Donna, and Lisa will all be ordained on the 2nd of December, and we invite you to come and celebrate with them as we launch them into ordained ministry. Then if you will, mark your calendar on December 12th is the annual meeting of the church, both live and online. As a member, we invite you to come to this gathering that's really critical because we believe that as we share transparent, accountable stewardship to you of what the Lord has brought us through and where we're headed, that we can discern the will and voice of God to the vote of this church family. There are three matters you must vote on this year. Number one is the election of our officers. There are those who feel the call of the Lord to step up in service. If you're a member of the church, you can go out to the website even now and watch the video introduction of all the candidates who are running for a particular office. We ask you to take a moment to watch those, to be prayerful, to know that the online ballot will be sent to you on November 24th and you have till December 4th to fill that out. We're asking you within that 10-day that window to make certain you fill out that ballot that we may know whom the Lord has called to serve in this church family. Then when we gather on the 12th of December for our annual meeting, we will vote on the status of emeritus for some deacons who have served for some more than 30, almost 40 years, whom the deacons have recommended to be an emeritus status, one of the highest honors of the church. And then we will also vote on our 2024 budget. You've had an opportunity through congregational hearings and through the questions of the Finance and Budget Committee to see that budget in its entirety, but we need your vote in order to act on it as we move into 24. So join us, if you will, as we move into the end of the year. You all know that the eves, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, are on Sundays this year. So I'll let you know that we will have on Christmas Eve our regular Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and then we will have our Vesper service at 11 p.m. going into Christmas Day. New Year's Eve is on Sunday. In New Year's Eve, we will have worship at 8. We'll have worship at 11. And that's going to be the end of it. Amen. Uh, we're going to have worship at 8. And we're going to have worship at 11. And if you want to watch worship at midnight or at 10 p.m., we encourage you to go online, pull up an old service, and make yourself happy in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> and then finally, I'm really excited to share with you some awesome good news. How many people want some good news? We need some good news. Yesterday out at the St. James in Springfield, we hosted the 21st annual HBCU Festival, and can I tell you the joy of watching 7,000 high school students of color be exposed to 75 HBCUs on yesterday? It was... They highlight black violence and crime. What they need to do is highlight yesterday. To see these students with college on their mind, being exposed to the rich legacy of our HBCUs. 7,000 students were there. 1,200 on-site admissions letters were given. Wait, wait, don't shout too early. And 4.3 million in scholarship was given on yesterday to those students on their way to college. Praise be to God. Yeah. 
I am excited to be part of a church family that does more for HBCUs than any other organization, entity, or business in the entire world. No one supports our historically black colleges more than the Alfred Street Baptist Church. And I want to thank you all for making that happen. As we thank God for that, I also want to recognize our lead who, who gave hours and months of her life to make it happen, Sister Brittany Johnson. Brittany, would you stand? I know she'll be embarrassed, but thank you so much, Brittany, for your service. Brittany led a team of more than 250 people that made it happen. If you served yesterday in any way, if you were part of the planning and the execution, I'm gonna ask that entire volunteer squad to stand. If you served on yesterday, I wanna thank you all for making that a reality. Thank you, thank you. Amen. Listen, the joy of the Lord is our strength and there's great joy that we have in seeing what God is doing. In and through the life of the church, it's possible because you pray and you decide to be obedient and generous with what God puts in your heart. We don't raise an official offering during worship. We just trust and believe that with all the online platforms available to you, that even in this service or immediately afterwards, even if you're watching online, you'll take this opportunity to be faithful, to give unto the Lord as the Lord has been faithful unto you. I'm gonna ask God's blessings upon our giving, then we receive the word of God in song through the voices of triumph and prepare to receive it in sermon. Come up, y'all. It's so good to have all the VOT back in the choir loft today. Let's ask God's blessings over our giving. In your word, Lord, you asked us, would we rob you? Would we sit and allow you to be this good to us and decide that a small portion of what you've given we won't give back? It's not stealing, it's armed robbery. I pray now, O oh Lord, that you move upon our hearts with a spirit of obedience and generosity to whatever you would call us to surrender and to sacrifice today, that we may have confidence in knowing that we're sowing into good soil. Lord, that we will see the fruit of it, not only in our own lives, but in the way our giving helps change the world. Thank you, O oh God, for being a blessing unto us. And now in obedience, we seek to be a blessing to your kingdom. Receive these gifts that we give, in the spirit of joy in which we release them. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we do pray. Amen.
will see me through it all if I trust in God again.
there's not much that needs to be said after that. Somebody, you've already got the sermon you came to church for today. Trust God again. Lord, we bow before you as those who know there have been moments when our faith was failing, when our trust had been fractured, when our confidence was broken, and yet you kept us in those moments. And so uh, we came to church today, God, because we're going to give you another try. We know that you are too good of a God to fail us. You're too strong of a God to let us down. So we're going to trust in you with all of our heart. Leaning not into our own understanding in all our ways, acknowledging you. Asking you to direct our path. May your word direct our path. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we do pray. Amen. On the Sunday morning in this sacred moment, I would invite you to hear once again a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, where we continue from where the Lord left us a few weekends ago. Matthew, chapter 16, as we hear the word of God, it is our custom to ask those who are physically able to stand with us as together we read and hear the word of God. Matthew, chapter 16, I begin reading in your hearing in verse number 13, listen for the word of the Lord. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As some of you may recall, two weeks ago, we began a sermon that prayerfully we will conclude today, simply called Since 1803. It's in preparation for and to give perspective to the fact that next Sunday in this space, we celebrate the 220th anniversary of the Alfred Street Baptist Church. Amen. And I feel a real press from the Lord to make certain that we don't miss the magnitude of this moment. Last month, we celebrated 15 years of all the amazing things we've seen God do in a relationship between pastor and people. But 15 years is but a drop in the bucket of what God has been doing in this church family for more than two centuries. It's a reminder to us that Alfred Street did not start when any of us joined this church. That for 220 years, God has been keeping this church alive, thriving, and unified. For 220 years, the grace of God has kept us. For 220 years, the hand of God has protected us. 
For 220 years, the sacrificial giving of ancestors who sat in these seats before your grandmama knew your granddaddy <laughs> have provided for us. For 220 years, the prayers of the righteous have sustained us. For 220 years, the Holy Spirit has equipped us. The word of God has directed us. The songs of Zion have enlivened us. The worship of the Lord has shaped us. The blood of the lamb has covered us. And the name of Jesus has saved us. And even though the same tempest winds of time and technology, of corruption and competition, of pandemic and politic, of bad decision and lack of vision that have destroyed every business and every industry in the United States of America, even though, though those same winds have railed against the church. Yet by the grace of God, we've been here since 1803. And they're in the ability, the capacity of a church to survive some 200 plus years really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who reads the Bible. It is exactly what Jesus prophesied and predicted would happen when a church was anchored upon the rock upon which he built it. Hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Terrence, I'm getting some feedback if you can echo that down. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You will miss the significance of these words if you detach them from what Jesus declared in Matthew chapter 7 in that parable of the foolish and the wise builders where he says, if you build on sand, the house ain't got a chance. But if you build on the rock, the winds can blow, the rain can fall, the storm will come, and whatever is built on the rock ain't got a choice but to survive. And so we've been asking the question, what is the rock that the church is built upon? When Jesus declared, I will build my church on a rock, what rock was he talking about? What, what is the stable foundation that keeps church alive through all the mess and the moments of storm and gossip and rumoring and things that we do to church? How is it that church, what's the secret sauce to helping church be strong in a time like this? What is the rock? Well, you remember we've uncovered two things in Matthew chapter 16. The first rock upon which the church is built is the identification of Jesus as the Christ. That what grounds us is an understanding that this Jesus we worship is the Son of God and is the Messiah. Jesus asked these disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, John the Baptist and Elijah and Jeremiah. He said, I can't build a church on that. Who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, now I can build church because what glues us together, what holds us, what, what strengthens us is not that we all read the Bible and come to the same doctrinal conclusion. What makes us church is not that we all think the same and vote the same on every political issue. What makes us church is not how much you love your pastor. What makes us church is that on every pew and every section and every seat, there is somebody who says that this Jesus I serve was not just some prophet. He was not just some fly-by-night person. No, this was the Son of God who came to pay the price for our sins. And one day, this man named Jesus on a cross on Calvary sacrificed his life as an atonement for our sin. And they buried a dead body. But early on Sunday morning, that dead body got up and declared, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. He is the resurrected, risen, reigning redeemer. 
That's what makes us church. Not what service you come to, not what ministry you serve in, not whether you fit the dress code, not how much you give, but do you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ? It's not only the identification of Jesus as the Christ, it is the transformation that's happening within each and every one of us. Here's what makes church, church. When we acknowledge that believing in Christ invites God into our lives to change some things, to work on some things, to prune some things, to change how we live our lives. If you join church and you just want to be who you was, you're in the wrong place. That we come recognizing that all of us are undergoing transformation. I need you to be patient with me. If, if on any given week you don't think I am who I need to be, be patient with me. Because God ain't through with me yet. God is working on me. And there, there's some witnesses in this place that if you look at where you are on this November 2023 with where you were last year, I just want to take a survey. Is there anybody here who can show enough to declare God has worked a change in my life? Don't fool me now. I'm looking for some folk that know I ain't what I ought to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Ah, don't cuss like I used to. I don't slap folk like I want to. I don't stay at home on Sunday mornings. God is changing me. He tells Simon, your new name is Peter. Because I'm changing you. But your Simon keeps showing up. And what makes church church is when we realize that no one in here is a perfect Peter. That everybody. Has a sinning Simon. That's just in remission. He he's changing me. But don't push me. He's working on me. But don't catch me at the wrong time. I'm, I'm trying to be who God called me to be. But, but if you get on my last good nerve at the wrong time, may the Lord forgive me for what I'm about to say. I know there's some... Mm, I, I, I know. Okay. okay. I see you ain't got no Simon in you. you. You've been delivered from everything. You've been saved from everything. I just want to talk to the real folk who can acknowledge that every now and then there is something inside of me that I need God to just push down a little bit harder. Church is not where we judge our Simon. It's where we encourage our Peter. The rock is the identification. The rock is the transformation. But let me show you two more, and then I'll let you go fix your Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> the rock of the church, Cherise, is the confrontation that is our assignment. The identification of Christ, the transformation within us, and the confrontation that is our assignment. Notice, beloved, that when Jesus speaks the word of church for the very first time in the Bible here in Matthew chapter 16, he does not give the promise that it's just going to be easy. Jesus doesn't tell them that, that when you join this thing called church, it ain't going to be nothing other than hallelujah, amen, and thank you, Jesus. No, in the very same breath, in the very same sentence, in the very same verse that Jesus mentions church, he also mentions something else. The gates of hell. It's almost as if he wants you to understand that church will always be in continual 
confrontation with the gates of hell. Let me teach you a little bit about the gates of hell. And, and I do this so that you understand how the people would have heard it. The gates of hell, as you saw, is, is a Greek term, pule hades. Everyone say pule, pule. Hades. hades. I want you to sound smart on your job tomorrow. <laughs> pule gate hades hell. You need to understand the Greco-Roman concept of pule hades to understand what Jesus is saying. Can I teach Bible? Yes. The term hades, hades, was a reference in Greco-Roman mythology to the underworld where the dead lived. And in the underworld, the realm of the dead, Pluto or Hades reigned. Now the problem was that Pluto, Hades, the underrealm, was never content to remain in the underrealm. But that Hades always wanted to break loose from the underworld and be manifest on the earth. And so in the Greco-Roman mind, they understood that hell, every now and then, escapes the realm of the dead and shows up in the realm of the living. You ain't got to die to taste hell. There ought to be an amen. Can I, can, I, can I give it to you in Howard John Wesley language? Hell has free samples on earth. And when you live long enough, you'll get a little taste of hell while you're still alive. Loneliness can be hell. Chronic pain can be hell. Financial insecurity can be hell. An addicted child can be hell. Going through a divorce can be hell. Burying mama can be hell. Hell wants to be on earth, but it's pule hades, the gates of hell. The term pule, gates, was never used to reference the gates of a mansion. It wasn't used to mention the gates of a city or the gates of a fortress. Earl, the term pule, gates, was limited to the gates of a prison. Pule Hades literally means the prison of hell. The prison of hell, which is always trying to increase its boundaries and make itself known on the earth. So when Jesus mentions the phrase gates of hell, the people who heard it understood the hell on earth that can be a prison. Now, if I ain't lost you, Grab your purse and get ready for your shout. Because Jesus says the gates of hell will be in confrontation with the church. The word church is the term ecclesia. Ecclesia, by definition, means to be called out of. So what is the church? The church is the community of folk who've been called out of the prison of hell by the blood of Jesus to live in victory and not in hell. Oh, I'm about to shout myself. That church literally means I've been called out of hell. Um, um, um. Now, here comes the confrontation. Here's the battle. You ready? Remember, hell wants to be on earth. And hell is never content that you've been called out of it. Hell always wants you back. And sin is a temptation to go back into the prison of hell. Come, 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 come. And the reason church is so important 
church keeps me from violating my parole. Uh, uh, um. uh. Church keeps me from going back into the hell that Jesus brought me out of. Family, family, I'm sorry to say for everybody, that's why I come to church every Sunday. Because I got too much hell waiting on me on Monday and church keeps me out of hell. Ah. That's why I shout on Sunday. That's why I drive around to find a parking space. That's why I run to the altar at prayer time. That's why I give God glory, because church, I wish I had somebody that could declare, church kept my mind right. Church kept my heart right. Church kept my life together. You got to be careful how you treat folk in church because you never know how close I am to going back to prison. <laughs> uh. Don't ever tell me to sit down. I'm trying to stay out of jail. Don't ever tell me not to give him glory. I'm trying not to go back to where God brought me from. Um, he says, there is a confrontation between church ecclesia and Puleades, the gates of hell, they are always confronting each other. Now, if you understand the confrontation between the church and the gates of hell, you'll understand why you can't go to every church. Come, come, come. Uh, I'm going to tell you why some churches fail. Because they spend more time fighting other churches than they do fighting the gates of hell. We were not called to engage in civil war in Christianity. We were called to fight against the gates of hell. Y'all, I have problem with churches, pastors, and preachers that build a name and brand casting down and critiquing other churches. Isn't it amazing how we fight more among ourselves than we do the gates of hell? We spend time fighting about how we define abomination and how you read this verse and who can and cannot preach and what you should and should not wear when you join church and who should and should not be allowed to run for office and what ministry you can and cannot serve in and how much you ought to give and what day you ought to worship on. And we wind up fighting each other so much that we ignore the gates of hell. I got a problem if you got a lot to say about how I read scripture, but ain't got nothing to say about mass incarceration of black and brown bodies. I've, I've got a problem. When, when, when you want to criticize how I read Sodom and Gomorrah, but you ain't gave a dime to HBCUs, I've got a problem when you want to tell me I'm wrong because we ordain women and allow women to preach, but you don't say anything about the war in Israel and Palestine. You don't call for any ceasefire. You stand on all this doctrinal stuff, but you ain't got nothing to say about the gates of hell. Mm, I'm about to get in trouble. Can I push it? Watch what Jesus says. It's in the Bible. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Y'all, I have read this backwards 
my entire life. Because many of us were raised with a traditional understanding that to say the gates of hell should not prevail against the church means that the church will survive whatever hell brings its way. That's not what Jesus is saying. Oh, can I teach Bible? The word prevail, overcome, is this Greek term, katiskuo. Everyone say it with me, katiskuo. Katiskuo literally means to be stronger than. When something cannot prevail, when something is katiskuo, it is stronger than something else. It, the best way to understand katiskuo is a wrestling match. The two wrestlers are engaged. And one of them is stronger than the other. And the one that is stronger prevails against the one that cannot prevail. The one that cannot prevail is weaker than the one it's wrestling against. So when Jesus says the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church, he's saying that the gates of hell is the weaker one. Ha, ah, here it is. You missed it. So when Jesus says the gates of hell should not prevail against the church, he's not saying the church can withstand the attack of hell. He's saying hell cannot withstand the attack of the church. Yeah, you, 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 woo wee too early in the morning. I'm sorry. Um, Y'all, we got this thing backwards. We are not on defense. We're supposed to be on offense. We're not supposed to endure the attack. We're supposed to bring the attack. The devil should be afraid of the smoke the church wants to bring against the gates of hell. Uh, we are called to attack. Now, now, Marcus, it's going to get quiet because this is Alfred Street. And I know, I know the level of education that is in the church. <laughs> Y'all, but this verse is a reminder to us that spiritual warfare wow. is a reality. Yeah. That the minute you said yes to Jesus... You were enlisted in an eternal battle against that which is not flesh and blood. I know I'm in Bible territory. When Jesus started talking to this same Peter and predicting he would betray him, Jesus said, I got bad news for you, Peter. Satan has requested you. Peter would then write in 1 Peter 5, that our adversary walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Paul picked it up in Ephesians when he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. This ain't a flesh battle. This is spiritual warfare. There are spirits that we fight against. Lying spirits, depressing spirits, jealous spirits, whoredom spirits, perverting spirits, incarcerating spirits, binding spirits, seducing spirits, the spirit of the Antichrist. You and I are engaged in spiritual warfare. That's the bad news. Here's the good news, that when you became part of the church, Christ granted you the weapons you need to fight the spiritual battle. Come here, come here, come here. Hold the shout, here it is. He says, Peter, I'm gonna give you authority to bind and to loose on earth so that you understand that in this battle, between church and hell, you've got power to bind 
and to loose. That we are authorized agents of the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are called to attack and overcome every demon, every devil, every disease, every principality, every power, every wicked thing, everything that exalts itself against the name of Jesus Christ. We've been given power. Now, here's the problem with the church. Here's the problem with Alfred Street. You know what we are? We're a Ferrari. That never got out of second gear. Look good, but there's more underneath the hood that we've never stepped on and used because we're so content to look good and drive down in second gear. And the Lord says, here's the problem. I've given you authority to engage in this spiritual confrontation, but because you are content with looking cute and pretty in worship, you've not operated in the full authority that I've given you to cast down demons and to pull down strongholds and to rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. And I came by today to declare a new season in this church with folk who believe that the gates of hell cannot stand. Um, um, um. I'm sorry. It's time to operate in spiritual authority. Hear me, hear me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you kojic. I'm not telling you you need to run up and down the aisles. I'm not saying you need to fall out at the floor and speak in tongues. I'm not telling you to grab snakes and let them bite you and say I'm healed in Jesus name. I'm not telling you to come up here and let me hit you and you fall out at the altar. I'm not telling you to stop taking your medication. I came by to tell you what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, although we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Uh. I want us to operate in the authority God has given to cast hell down. Can y'all sound, you scared me like you need to preach. Um, when, when I was a child, Russell often times, I would catch my mother coming in my bedroom at night. She thought I was asleep. And when she thought I was asleep, she would lay her hands on me. And she'd go to praying. Raise up my son. Lord, make him great in your sight. Keep him from all isms and addictions. Guide his feet. And you can't tell me today at 51 that I am not in this space because I had a mother who understood the power of confronting the gates of hell and declaring you shall not have my child. You cannot destroy my family. You will not break up this household. 
that there's something about binding and loosing the devil in Jesus' name, of rebuking the enemy by the blood of Jesus, by anointing with oil and declaring, you shall be healed in Jesus' name. We come to confront the gates of hell. Operating in that authority does not mean you have to be weird. It means that we understand we are engaged in confrontation and too long we have been the victim when we're supposed to be the conqueror. I have no problem laying hands on my children. I keep oil in my car. I have no problem rebuking Satan in Jesus' name. There's nothing wrong with pleading the blood of Jesus over your family. There's nothing wrong with decreeing and declaring that I am a conqueror, I am the head, I am above. He said, we're in confrontation. Stop fighting each other and start fighting the gates of hell. Okay, okay. Um, what is the rock? It's the identification that Jesus is the Christ. It's the transformation that's happening within each and every one of us. It's the confrontation that is our assignment. But let me give you the last one. It is the revelation of what the Lord has done. What binds us together is recognizing God did this. Oh, God, I, I'm about to shout. Um, watch what happens. Jesus says to, to the disciples, who do people say I am? They gave their answer. He looked at Simon and said, and who do you say I am? Simon said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He identified Jesus as the Christ. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. But my father was in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I build my church. I know we're at the end of the sermon, so I don't want to bring the spirit down, but I need to teach for a moment. Because verse 18, when Jesus says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I build my church. You cannot underestimate the importance of verse 18. Verse 18 is one of the dividing moments between Catholicism and Protestantism. Teach Pastor Wesley. How you interpret verse 18 will determine whether you are Catholic or Protestant. Can I teach? He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I build my church. Notice the play on words. The name Peter is the Greek term petros. The term rock is the term petra. You are petros, and upon this petra I build my ecclesia. Now, because of the role Peter played in leading the church, and the authority Jesus gives when he says, I will give you the power to bind and to loose. Catholic doctrine assumes that the Petra is Petros. You with me? The rock is Peter himself. Because Petros and Petra are too close to the same. So they interpret it as meaning Jesus built the church on Peter which is why Peter was given authority over all the church to bind on earth what would be bound in heaven. So whatever Peter said was law on earth, heaven itself would say was law because Peter said it because Peter was given special authority. Verse 18 is the Catholic foundation of a doctrine called Petrine Succession. Welcome to Alfred Street. Petrine Succession. Say it with me, Petrine Succession. Petrine Succession is the belief that the church was built on the leadership of Peter who was given special authority by Jesus himself and that that authority is passed down to all of Peter's spiritual uh, successors who are called the Pope. The Pope 
is the spiritual descendant of Peter who receives the same authority Jesus gave Peter to bind on earth what would be bound in heaven. And so in the Catholic Church, what the Pope says is law. Why? Because the Pope is the descendant of Peter and Jesus gave Peter the authority to say and to build and we recognize that the Pope is nothing other than Peter in the flesh. Now, let me tell you something. I don't condemn Catholics because they're Christian. I just disagree that Petra is Petros. I don't agree that the church was built on Peter himself. Why? Because Peter got too much Simon in him. The church is not built on you and me because we're too sinful for the church to exist on us. The church is not built on your pastor because in 10 years he's retiring. and y'all gonna have to find another pastor. The church is not built on the choir singing. There's too much ego up there. It's not built. Not you all. The church is not built on who runs for office because you get too fickle and get an attitude when things don't go your way and you want to quit and you want to resign. The church is not built on your little giving of your little tithe because you don't do it faithfully anyway. This is not what the church is built on. Go on, be pastor, pastor. So watch what Jesus says. Upon this rock, I will build Y'all read the Bible. My church, every now and then, we need to be reminded that this is the Lord's church. That, that this is built by the Lord himself. It is his body, and you and I may come and go, but it's the Lord's church. Listen, listen don't you ever think that if you don't serve, the ministry won't be successful. Don't, don't you ever think that if you don't shout, God ain't going to be praised. Don't you ever think that if you don't give, the church won't survive. That if you don't serve, nobody's going to fall. Listen, at the end of the day, this is God's church. Okay, um, let me help you. My son is home from, from college. Um, and Paul, he got, got, I bought him a car right before he turned 18. Got him a car because he's driving. And I, I needed him to start driving himself because it's too much. So I got him a car. Now, now before, before you, it, it, it's, it is an entry-level Toyota RAV4. There's nothing automatic in this car at all. There's no sunroof. There's no heated seats. You got to roll the windows down. You got to put the key in and turn it to start the car. He don't need nothing. Look, the right pedal make it go. The left pedal make it stop. That's all he needs. So I bought him a car. Bought him a car. Um, he came home the other day, gets in the car, he ain't, he ain't been driving about three months, goes out, hits a curb, and pops both tires on the passenger side. I, how, how you pop both? <laughs> well, you hit the first and just kept going? I, what? <laughs> pop both tires. So, so we got to take the car up to Toyota dealership because I bought tire insurance. I learned that a long time ago. Uh, to get the tires fixed, and when the car had some other work to do, they called Deuce on his phone to authorize the work on the car. Um, I told you I'm saved, but don't push me. I, I, got, a, I got an attitude. I said to him, why they call you to authorize the work on the car let me tell you this little, this little. <laughs> boy of mine said. He said to me, well, it's my car. <laughs> so I had to remind him, son, it's my car. I just let you drive it. <laughs> he says to me, but my name is on the account. I said, but my name's on the title. 
And every now and then I need to remind you who bought the car, who paid for the car, and who fixes the car when it's broken. Come by, tell you, Alpha Street, this ain't your church. <laughs> you just driving for a little while. But this church was paid for by the blood of Jesus. It was redeemed by the resurrection of the Lamb. And although our name may be on the flyer, God's name is on the title. And this is the Lord's church. So watch, watch what Jesus says. Peter, um, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but God did. He lets Peter know that whatever good happens, it's not flesh and blood, but it's what the Lord has done. Goodbye, Alfred Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I came by to tell you that's what church ought to do. Remind you every now and then that flesh and blood didn't do it, but that God did it in your life. Is there anybody here who knows God did it? When you look at my life, God did it. When you see the car I drive, God did it. When you see the degree on my wall, God did it. When you see my children, God did it. God did it. God did it. Is there anybody here that knows it ain't flesh and blood? It's not my hands. It's not myself. But look at what the Lord. I, I got to go. I got to say that because every now and then you might be tempted to think you did it by yourself. You got it by yourself. You earned it by yourself. And I came today to remind you this is not flesh and blood, but look at what the Lord has done in my life. Do me a favor, slap five with your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, look at what God did. Look at how the Lord blessed me. Look at how the Lord kept me. Look at how the Lord brought me through. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Hey! Uh, uh, nudge somebody and tell them God did it. God made a way. God brought me through. God saved my life. God delivered me. God held me. God kept me. God made the way. God did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, if you're able, won't you stand? Listen, wherever you are, whatever you look at in your life, whatever good you've achieved or accomplished, whatever blessing you put your name on, flesh and blood didn't do it. Your credit score didn't do it. Your resume didn't do it. Your GPA didn't do it. Your speed dial list didn't do it. This is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. God, we humble ourselves in your presence. And thank you for what you did that we couldn't do for ourselves. We're saved and that's not our own doing. We're growing in the spirit. That's not our own doing. We woke up this morning. That's not our own doing. And Lord, I just want to thank you for what you have done. I thank you for this thing called church. Lord, for giving us the power to confront the gates of hell. 
for reminding us that you blessed us, for working a change in us and leading us to identify that Jesus is the Christ. Lord, upon this rock, you've built this church. And we thank you for the 220 years that it's been leading women and men to Jesus Christ. In this season, when we drive the car, may we be faithful of what belongs to you. Thank you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you sit down, if you're here today, you know when God is calling you. You know when there's an itch that needs to be scratched. You know when life feels incomplete and nothing else fills the void. I'm going to tell you without a shadow of a doubt that you need Christ in your life. That faith in Jesus Christ not only saves you, it preserves you through the hell of life that life will bring. And you need a church family. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Don't tell me you're spiritual but not religious. Don't tell me that because of what happened over at Mount This or Second Baptist That, that you gave up on church. If you go to a restaurant and you don't like the food, you don't stop eating, you just find somewhere else to go. I invite you today, online and in this space, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to become a member of a church family that's built on the rock that allows it to survive. After we leave this service today, if you're online, you can fill out a form right there. Go to our website. Go even now. Let us know who you are and that you desire to give your life to the Lord. In this space, don't run out. Come down to the altar. There'll be some sisters and brothers down here, our deacons, our servants, who will be glad to pray with you and welcome you into the body of Christ Jesus. We leave this place in the grace of God and the peace of God, going out to share the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thanksgiving. Please also don't forget to be faithful and obedient and generous as you give, as the Lord is blessed on your heart to do so, that we might continue to share this amazing love of God in others in our world. And now to the Almighty, the All-Wise, the Eternal, the Sovereign, the faithful and omnipotent God who alone is creator of heaven and earth. To the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who always and alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer, to the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be both glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. As the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return, said amen.
grace of God, may the grace of God go with you. Welcome to our Alfred Street online worship experience. Now, here are our upcoming announcements for this week. We know that these are difficult and challenging times. We invite you to stay connected by participating in our online worship services and remain faithful in your giving online via our Alfred Street website, ASBC app, and on our text messaging system. If you have any questions about giving, please feel free to email our finance department at finance at alfredstreet.org. If you're interested in becoming a member of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church, please email deacons with an S at alfredstreet.org or complete the membership form on our website or on our ASBC app. Are you looking for an incredible opportunity to share your musical talents? If so, look no further. Alfred Street Sanctified Symphony Orchestra is thrilled to announce that they are recruiting talented musicians like you to join their harmonious family. They're calling for all musicians to join them every Friday evening from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Send an email to sanctifiedsymphony at alfredstreet.org if interested. They can't wait to welcome you into the Alfred Street Baptist Church Sanctified Symphony Orchestra. Hey, Alfred Street. Versus is back in stock. Our Versus team has been working around the clock to create another batch of our popular Versus Bible-based trivia card game, and they're now available for purchase. That's right. Purchase your set of Versus cards today before we sell out again. Visit our website or ASBC app and be the first to get your hands on Versus, a Bible-based trivia game by Alfred Street Baptist Church. Family, it's time for registration for Village again. We have just finished the fall and over a thousand people participated in Village. And I've captured some of the things they've said about this season, that Village is my safe space, that Village is where I'm accountable, that Village is where my brothers and sisters pray for me, that Village is where I get carried through my tough times. We want you to experience Village in exactly the same way. So on the screen, you'll see a QR code where you can register for the upcoming season. Doesn't matter whether you're a member of ASBC or not, we welcome everybody. Registration is open until the 15th of December and the next Village season begins with the sermon preached on Sunday, January 21st. Come on, register. Move from crowd to community and find yourself in that safe, wonderful space that is Village. We can't wait to welcome you. See you soon. Our ASBC discipleship groups are coming together to provide Thanksgiving blessings to many families in the DMV. Alfred Street members, here is an opportunity to connect with your ASBC discipleship groups today. We are collecting contributions and donations to provide Thanksgiving blessings to many families in the Washington, D.C. area. All contributions towards this effort are appreciated. The deadline to make your contribution or donation is Sunday, November 19th on the website and online Realm Giving Portal. Our Ministers in Training program is accepting applications for their 2024 cohort. The MIT program is designed to offer a theological foundation to new ministers desirous of serving the Alfred Street Baptist Church. The MIT program is mandatory for all ministers in training and is a prerequisite for licensure. Applications are being accepted now through Monday, November 27th. Email MIT at alfredstreet.org for details. Alfred Street's Office of Christian Care and Counseling, led by the Reverend Dr. Latasha Morgan, LPC, present November is Finding Hope and Healing, Navigating Grief During the Holidays. The holiday season is often a time of joy, celebration, and togetherness. However, for those who have experienced the loss of a loved one, it can be a time of deep emotional turmoil and grief. Check out a special message written by our own Miss Angela Liggins, ASBC Missions Program Coordinator and daughter of our beloved Miss Rosette Tab Graham, who transitioned in December of 2020. Visit our website and or virtual events page for helpful links and more information on surviving the holidays. For additional assistance, email pastoralcounseling at alfredstreet.org. 
calling all parents and guardians of children, youth, and teens. Alfred Street's Children and Youth Ministries are back. We're currently accepting registrations for Kid Street, Crossover, and Higher Ground. Visit our website to register your child or youth today. Our November 2023 Pastor's Pick Book of the Month is Let the Oppressed Go Free, Exploring Theologies of Liberation by the author Reverend Dr. Marvin McMichael, a pastor, scholar, and best-selling author, releases this new volume that considers the evolution of liberation theologies in their historic and cultural contexts. Alfred Street invites everyone to join the Joyce K. Peterson Handbell Ringers. They are thrilled to announce that their ensemble recruitment is now open. If you have a passion for music and a heart for worship, we invite you to be a part of this harmonious journey. If you can read music and are eager to contribute your talents to a musical ministry that touches souls, this is your moment to shine. For more info and to express your interest, please email handbell at alfredstreet.org. Alfred Street's Office of Christian Care and Counseling, in conjunction with our Divorce Care Ministry, present their fall sessions virtually every Thursday, starting at 12 p.m. noon through 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. These sessions will continue through December 21st. Email divorcecare at alfredstreet.org. Our Faith Savage Gun tutorial ministry has a new home online. Communicate, learn, and stay informed all in one place. Visit our new webpage and check us out today at alfredstreet.org. Email tutorial at alfredstreet.org for details. Our Office of Christian Care and Counseling presents our hybrid, the Chronic Pain Support Group, facilitated by Mr. Jorge Wallace. This is a weekly support group designed to aid in the recovery needed from the emotional and spiritual debilitation of chronic pain and chronic illness. Recovery is defined as the ability to live peacefully, joyfully, and comfortably with ourselves and others. Chronic Pain Anonymous is a worldwide fellowship of individuals that understand the isolation, fear, and despair many have experienced when living with unpredictable and life-changing chronic illness and chronic pain. This support group will occur every Wednesday through December 20th. Email pastoralcounseling at alfredstreet.org for details. Our ASBC Village Study Guide is now available on the website to download. Be sure to check out a copy if you want to go deeper with Pastor Wesley's sermon prepared for you by the Villages of Alfred Street team. The guide is available online at alfredstreet.org. We invite everyone to join us for daily prayer call at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Join us in prayer and praise Monday through Friday only by dialing 425-436-6277, access code 246-114-POUND sign. Again, that's 425-436-6277, access code 246-114-POUND sign. Our new prayer line number will accommodate up to 2,000 participants. However, once we reach capacity, we will continue to offer the playback option. Call our playback number anytime after 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time each day, Monday through Friday, and you'll be able to replay the prayer call that you missed. To reach the playback line, please dial 425-436-6278 and enter the access code 246114-POUND sign. Please note that this is not a toll-free number and therefore, depending on your phone carrier, rates may apply. Hey, Alfred Street family and friends. Are you visiting us for the very first time? Or perhaps you're new to Alfred Street and you want to stay connected to us or receive the latest Alfred Street updates via text. If so, all visitors text the word visitors with an S to our new direct text number 571-977-4525. That's 571-977-4525. Also, we invite you to tune in to our Faith Forward Weekly Radio Broadcast featuring Pastor Howard John Wesley every Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Magic 102.3 FM and 92.7 FM for a powerful sermon that will move you forward in your faith. For more information on these and all the exciting events taking place here at Alfred Street, please log on to alfredstreet.org.